Hello, my name is Arturo Hinojosa, and I'm a principal product manager at Amazon Web Services. Today, we're going to talk about making the career transition from pre-sales to product management. So a little bit about myself before we get started and you know why I'm sort of talking on this topic. So as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a PM at AWS and I work on the non-relational databases team. Um, today, I manage a team of product managers and outbound specialists working on our database services, you know, helping them bring to the market, defining the roadmap, those sorts of things. I've been with AWS since about 2016, but not too long ago, before I was a PM at AWS, I actually started off my career as a solution architect and sales engineer. So I did straight out of college, um, helping customers evaluate, deploy, and integrate software, working on things such as billing systems and telecommunication, telecommunication software and financial services stuff, you know, looking for money laundering and you know, all sorts of other financial, financial no-nos. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I worked as an SE and an SA for, you know, for about six years, you know, and you know, I often get the question of saying, hey, Arturo, like, I mean, how did you sort of go from being an SA and an SC to the PM, right? Um, and that was what products will invite him here to talk about today. So sort of what that career transition looked like, um, you know, what was my journey, uh, you know, why I, I believe, and I, and I know that, you know, technical SEs and SAs make really good product managers, as well as some of the lessons learned that I've picked up along the way and tips that you can use if you're also thinking about making that transition yourself. So, you know, hopefully you, you find today's presentation helpful. So, you know, my journey from SA, SC to PM was definitely not a straight line. Uh, there are lots of different, you know, things I've tried along the ways to sort of figure out what I like to do and what was I thought was interesting and, you know, where my skills are at. Um, and in each one of those sort of stops, I learned something to help me sort of take the next step. So I'll kind of walk you through my journey to give you a sense of like, you know, what sort of push me from the, along step to step, as well as sort of, you know, what I sort of picked up and the skills I picked up along the way, help me sort of ultimately get to where I am today, which is, you know, like a PM manager at AWS. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, I really started off my career out of college working as an SA. Um, and I, you know, I really was like a developer right? and I thought I was going to be like a coder, but then I realized, you know what, uh, coding is cool. I like it. It's a lot of fun. But what I really like is I like working with customers. I sort of like being out in the field. Um, you know, I, I don't just want to be, be behind the desk. So I, I still like to solve technical problems. I like sort of putting things together, you know, like, a, you know, like love Legos as a child, right? You know, I, I like the Legos of technology now as an adult. Um, and, you know, that's sort of what led me to being an SA, right? Is you get to really be hands-on with customers, listening to their problems, going very deep with them to solve, help them solve challenge things, help them grow their business. Um, over time, I, I also learned that I, you know, I, I like the sales side. That's why I sort of went from an SA to an SC, because uh, again, I really like sort of the, the you know, the high pressure situations of, of trying to win a deal. You know, I really like sort of building something new for our customers, help them understand the value, you know, of what the companies I work for offered. Um, and, I did, and I did that for a while. And again, it was a lot of fun. But, you know, sort of along the way, you know, the, the better of an SC and an SC that I became, you know, the more I did things like working on, you know, like sales enablement to sort of help other SCs and SAs on my team whenever we, we launch new products. Or um, I found myself often bringing a lot of feedback back to our product teams and engineering in terms of things that I was seeing as I work with customers. And I actually found that I really like doing that sort of stuff, right? Being, uh, you know, sort of on, on more of a little more of their strategy side, having more input on the product roadmap, I thought was pretty cool. And that sort of led me from being an SC to the, a, a role called technical product marketing. Um, you don't have them in every company, but basically what tech marketing does is sort of, they're like the field side of product management and product marketing. Um, you know, it like continue to sort of let me be hands-on with customer because in tech marketing, I was able to do things like help customers with new product betas and, you know, bringing feedback back to, to the, uh, the engineers and then the product managers, as well as doing things like giving roadmap presentation for customers who kind of wanted to know what was coming, to, coming down the pipe. And that was a lot of fun. Um, then, you know, I started working on, the, on this one project and I got exposed to then product marketing and more traditional product marketing which I really liked, right? Um, you know, basically it, it, it was like selling, but a lot more strategic. You've thought about things like pricing, which I never really thought about. You thought about messaging in a much deeper way. And, you know, I got this opportunity when this product I was working on and, and you know, my, the peer I was working with the product market decided to take a new role. I said, hey, I kind of raised my hand. So, you know what? You know, I'd like to try that. So I kind of asked if I could, you know, move from tech marketing to product marketing. And, and it was cool because it gave me a really cool opportunity to learn things I just had never thought about before. So being so technical, it gave me sort of my good sort of 
um, you know, first introduction, just really the business world. And I liked it, you know, product marketing is really, really fun. I found it that I actually really love doing things like developing messaging and positioning, understanding sort of where, you know, what are the opportunities for, for stuff. Uh, but it still was sort of like, you know, uh, you know I don't want to say it's a support role, but it still wasn't the ownership that I wanted. And that's really what pushed me eventually to, to just doing product matches. One, I wanted to build, you know, I, I didn't want to just sort of have influence on what the roadmap looked like. I really wanted to drive that. I wanted to say, hey, like, you know, these are the things that customers really, really need. These are the big problems we should be solving. And I want to have sort of more input on, on you know, how we do these things, right? Um, and it really let me leverage sort of my diverse work experience, uh, you know, as going back from being an SA and an SE, you know, even a developer and a technical marketing, I sort of was able to sort of bring all these different facets of my career together, because as a product manager, you really do have sort of 360 degree responsibility for the success of your product. And you have to be, you know, very cross-functional and work with all these different teams. So having that sort of perspective of what all these teams sort of did, you know, has made me a pretty successful PM because again, I'm able to have empathy with not just my customers, but other stakeholders and other members of the team. And it's really not that unique of a journey. Uh, it, it's pretty common, I found, for a lot of my PMs and a lot of the great PMs that I work with that have sort of that technical SC, SA, engineering background, right? Um, and again, it's a, probably one of the, the some of the best PMs I know have that background, especially when you look at things like technology companies or data companies, analytics, those things, there's such or anything where you're selling to a developer, right? I mean, it requires a, a very deep understanding of your customer, of the technology, how all those things work. Um, and, you know, PMs uh, that would have that strong technical background really have a, 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 an advantage here because you're able to can really empathize with your customer. And that's really what, what makes SEs and SAs great PMs, right? As a PM, you, you often find yourself working backwards from the customer. What does the customer need? What is their use case? As an SE and SA, because you spend so much time in the field, sleeves rolled up, arm in arm with the with the customer, working things out, trying to make things sort of work and trying to, try to fill in gaps where there are maybe some shortcomings. You just have such deep customer empathy on the realities of, of how deploying big software products and, and cloud services work, right? And it's not just that it's deep, it's also very practical. Um, I find sometimes with newer PMs, they have a challenge understanding like, Hey, like, you know, if I give, the, if I build it, they will come and the customers will love it and they'll, it'll, everything will just be amazing. Uh, it takes time for you as a PM to sort of build up the, the, just the experience, you know, that, Hey, like you have to migrate something a lot of times to go what you're using today to go over here, or just understand the internal politics of a, of an organization. The fact that, you know, like the IT guy probably doesn't know the whole company has to get buy-in from different stakeholders and, you know, there's budgets and that sort of stuff. So that real world practical experience just helps you sort of really understand, like, if I build it, what other stuff do I need to support it? And, and that's, that's a perspective that SAs and SEs bring to the product management, which is really powerful and, and differentiated. The other thing that helps is, you know, technical PMs are really able to earn trust with their engineers. Uh, you know, as an engineer, the last thing you want is a PM that tells you to go, you know, build this crazy thing or does you, which you don't understand, you know, like the requirements sort of what it, it'll, it'll poor defined, you know, what the use cases are not really clear. It causes a lot of ambiguity and a lot of churn for engineers, which is, you know, like, you know, the thing they hate the most, right? So if you can just go in there and say, hey, like, you know, I've got, the technical credibility because I've actually deployed these things like this before in my previous career. I understand how all these things work and the architectures of the customers and what other tools they're using and where these integration points are. Um, you know, that, that buys you a lot of credibility. And on top of that, you're able to provide a lot of context around use case, which engineers love. If you're able to kind of say, hey, like, you know, these are the SLAs that customers typically want to meet, or they're, these are the performance needs they have, or these are the other tools they use and how those tools interact with the stuff that you build, all that really rich context helps them build better products and helps help build better solutions and you help build better products. So, you know, the, those, those sort of two things, that ability to really empathy with the customer, work backwards from their world and be able to have earn, you know, trust with their technical stakeholders really is what gives the SEs and SAs a leg up when they sort of make that, that PM transition. But again, it's not all perfect. There are some things where you have to sort of grow as you sort of make the change, right? The first is learning to prioritize. You know, as an SC, you are like programmed to solve all the customer's problems because again, you're trying to win the deal, you're trying to help them out. So you will look for all these solutions and every everything's very critical. But when you kind of get to the, to the PM land, you know, it's not that you don't 
know these things exist, but you have to learn to prioritize. Because again, there are 50, there are 500, there are a million things you could work on. So you have to be much more calculating in, you know, what are the most important things I need to go work on? Um, you know, what are the things that are gonna have the biggest impact, both for my customers as well as for the business? Um, and you also have to balance those with the cost of those things, right? You know, yeah, maybe you could go spend six years building something amazing, and you should do that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but oftentimes, hey, if I spend like you know th th three months doing something, maybe I could unblock a little bit of it, and that's where you get the whole MVP thing. So again, it's sort of and and making those balancing decisions and sort of thinking about the business side of that sort of stuff is it takes a while to learn because again, SEs are sort of essays are programmed to help as a PM, you have to be sort of programmed to prioritize, understand why. Um, the other big thing you have to sort of learn is learning to say no. And it, this is again, really hard, right? Again, going back to essays and essays just want to please the customer. Um, but you also sometimes that essays have to say no, but when you say no, it's almost like a, a no because of this other thing that's out of my control. Like, no, I can't help you do that because we don't have that feature. Or no, I can't help you do that because it's going to take too long and you have a, have a tight deadline. Or, or all these, you know, all very good reasons why you have to say no, but you help the customer with a workaround. When you say no as a product manager, you know, it's a different no. It's a no or saying, hey, I understand what you're trying to say. Yep, it's totally valid. But for whatever very probably good reasons, I'm choosing not to prioritize it or I'm choosing just not to do it, right? Maybe it's it's too niche and, you know, there's an easy workaround or, you know, this is probably not that or this may not be the direction I want to grow the product or I think strategic. And those sorts of no's sting, sting customers a little bit more because it then feels like, you know, you're not listening to them. So you have to, you'll have to be more tactful about saying that no, um, you know, oftentimes bringing in an essay to help them with a the workaround, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like, you know, heavy as the head, the words, the crown of this year, right? Like the, the fact that you are sort of pushing back and challenging customers in a new way, um, there's something you just aren't programmed as an SE. And it takes a little while to sort of learn how, what is the right amount of backbone? You know, how do you sort of negotiate those situations? And then also like, who can help, you know, as an SC, SA, like you often are sort of like, you know, the last person on the line, it's up to you, you got to get it done to win the deal or, or, or get the deployment or meet the timelines. That's not true as a PM. Like there are other resources you have to learn to tap, you have to learn to delegate, you have to learn to leverage your, 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 your stakeholders, like bringing in an SA or bringing in a pro serve person or, you know, doing, providing a workaround or an alternative. So it, it, it's, it's, again, it's much more strategic. It's, it's, it's a little more tactful and it takes a while to sort of learn how to develop that, that muscle. So with that, let me talk about some of the lessons learned that I've sort of picked up along my journey here and hopefully they'll help you, uh, you know, that apply them to your own career. So, you know, when you first want to start off, you know, you have to learn how to ask a lot of why questions. And this is really the, 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 the key thing that you have to sort of pick up as a, as a PM is like, if I'm going to do, if we're going to do something as a company, why are we doing it? Why is it important? Why does the customer need this? Why is this a big opportunity? Because again, you could do 50 million things, but it's about prioritization. It's about understanding the context behind the things that you do. So you have to start thinking much bigger um, than you sort of did as an SA because you have to get, you know, you have to go ask an, an influence an engineering team to go spend a lot of resources, right? A lot of cycles building something, or you have to go convince your leadership that, hey, I need engineering resources to build this thing because there's a big opportunity here. You have to articulate all of these things. And, you know, these are sort of conversations you typically just don't have as an SE or an SA, because again, you're so focused on, on blocking something you know, often not thinking back about like, well, why am I unblocking it? Why is this the right thing to go unblock? What other things could I be unblocking instead or working on instead? So again, this is really where, where the, the developing that strategy muscle um, takes time. And the best way to do that is just practice and asking deep probing questions um, that sort of, you know, always challenge our assumptions, play your own devil's advocate. Um, these are the things that really help you sort of become a much more athletic PM. It's also because at some point you're also going to have to probably do things that where you're leaving sort of your, your domain expertise. You have to just be like a, a good PM athlete and asking probing questions, no matter the field or discipline, no matter what the product you're working on, will just make you a, a better PM and a better part of the team because you're able to sort of help the team make trade-offs and make really good decisions.
The other thing you have to learn to learn to be is relentlessly data driven. And this is something at AWS, you know, I, we take like to the one millionth degree, right? But it, it's so true because it's so valuable. You have to listen to the data. Um, you can't let things like a single customer experience completely influence your judgment, right? And I see this a lot with newer PMs, engineers that don't spend a lot of time in the field, that have one conversation with a customer, a couple conversations, they think they're soulmates, you know, they really, they think this is the, 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 the you know, the, the true North Star of all their decision-making but it's just one or two conversations. You have to really develop a mechanism up. You get and analyze trends across lots of customers, right? Um, is that, you know, is the right, that one conversation even the right customer or are they just not in your target customer segment because you're trying to fall because you think the opportunity is over here. So you have to really understand like, how am I going to, you know, talk to tens, dozens, hundreds of customers without actually talking to them? And whether that's leveraging your field teams, you know, setting up feedback sessions, you know, developing mechanisms to people for people that like record feature requests and the contact on those feature requests. But you really want to be able to say, hey, it's not that I talk to one customer, or two customers, I talk to a dozen, two dozen, 15, you know, whatever makes sense given the problem you're trying to solve. But I have a lot of data of diverse opinions that help me, help me inform, right? And I can challenge my assumptions, I can challenge the decisions because I have data that proves to me and, and I can use it to prove to others, these are the right things to go do. So you it really has to be relentlessly data driven. And you have to use that data even past the decision. You have to use that data to then also validate that was that the right decision? Because that can influence future decisions. So again, you have to really be used to learn to measure your performance using metrics. Like, um, are you are you measuring adoption? Are you measuring revenue? Are you measuring something like a customer satisfaction score? You want to start developing and use these North Star metrics to help you say, hey, like, you know, we think that you know, the right thing to do is this and to validate that we're going to measure this and then we're going to track that that measurement over time to see whether we're, we're you know, we're doing the right thing. And you also want to make sure you're grading that performance against your expectations. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest learning moments for me is, you know, sitting in this presentation to our executives and this other team was talking about this thing they just built and launched and they, you know, they were super excited about it and, you know, you're rattling off all these stats and, at one point, one of the guys, or I think it was one of the guys, was like, you know, and we've got, you know, like hundreds of big customers using this thing already. And the, the senior executive sort of looked at them with a, a, a kind of a quasi blank stare and said, well, you know, the guy was expecting like this, you know, this like clapping and cheering, but the executives kind of sat there was like, I, I don't know what that means. Is, is Were you expecting tens of customers at this point? or thousands of big customers at this point, because your answer is going to change how I feel about if you tell me you have hundreds of customers at this point, right? Either you're massively overperforming or you're underperforming. So being able to sort of develop these models and develop expectations, which then you can measure against your own metrics, is just that, that, that this is sort of what makes a, a fantastic PM that can really sort of then influence, influence and share metrics up and sort of say, hey, this is how we're doing. You know, things are going well. I know they're going well. They're better than we expected. So we're on the right strategy or, hey, things aren't going as we're expecting. We have to pivot. We have to make a change. We have to reevaluate something. So, you know, having this sort of data metrics is really important. And again, these are things that you never really had to do as an essay before. It's sort of like, win the deal. Yeah, awesome. High fives, right? But now you have to sort of say like, did I win the right deal? Did I win the deal enough? It's, it's, a, it's a whole different mentality. It takes a little bit of a, a, a time to learn. And just learning how to measure stuff uh, is one of the things that will help you quickly become a much better PM. So, you know, what are some tips, tips you can use to sort of pick up these skills? Uh, well, one is you have to sort of really capitalize on the overlap between the essay and PM roles. You know, and I, and I sort of purposely peppered some of these examples earlier as I was going through my career, career story and, and sort of stuff. But again, um, you know, there's lots of places where the PM job and the essay job intersect. And this is going to give you sort of a foot in the door if you are instead of making that change to go, you know, validate for yourself that, the, hey, this is the stuff I really want to go do. And it also is a good way to sort of network with the PM team if you do want to make the change, right? It's often how we source uh, SEs into our PM team. So one, you know, you don't want to set up and drive technical enablement. This is probably like the easiest thing you can do as, as an SA if you want to get more strategic, right? Because it gives you exposure to the strategy side. You're sitting with the PMs and the, and the PMMs that are working on these decks with you and, and, and making sure that you have the right messaging and positioning and there's the competitive analysis, all that stuff that goes into technical enablement. If you, if you like doing that sort of stuff, that is a good sign. You may be interested in product management long-term. This is probably the, the most PM-ish part of, of the SA role, right? Um, the other thing you, you can do is do things like support new product launches. You know, when I was in tech marketing, this is sort of really my first like, 
foray into the, into the, the roadmap side of stuff. So you work on these beta programs, you work on previews, you're out there with the customers, you're capturing feedback, you're bringing that back to the product team, you're iterating, they ask more questions, you go back, and you start to sort of learn what are the right sort of discovery questions, not just for winning a deal, but for building a product, right? You know, if I did this, what would you do? Or how would you like this to work? Uh, the different questions that you ask during a discovery where you're trying to qualify the customer. When you sort of start asking these beta preview questions, you're really building a rapport with the customer to understand how the product should work and what are the trade-offs the customer is willing to make. You know, these are the, the whole different new set of questions. And it also exposes you to working on a cross-functional team, you know, and, and seeing how a roadmap is developed. You know, it was really cool when I was working on beta programs, you sort of you know, work with the PMMs to build the deck for the, just, you know, to educate a customer on what the beta does and why they should try it. You work with the PM on, on sort of stuff. You might work with marketing to set up like a, you know, the email mechanism to sort of capture feedback surveys, that sort of thing. So it really gives you an opportunity to work with those teams that work on the product and strategy side and go to market side a lot more than you would have as an, as an essay. And then finally, you know, you want to get yourself involved and interject into the roadmap planning process. And every company has its own sort of way that it does this. But essentially, you know, every PM wants input on what they should be building next. You know, what are the challenges customers have with the product today? So if you can provide that input, um, you know, with one-on-one -on -one meetings with your PM or, you know, or, or joining the PM meeting or even better yet, aggregating feedback from across the fuel team to share with the PMs, that's a great great way to sort of get yourself interjected into the roadmap planning process. It really start getting a lot more strategic. You know, the second tip I'll offer is you want to leverage your network. And, you know, by leverage your network, I'm, you know, that sort of means like looking for internal openings on familiar product teams, right? Like today, if you work on, on, a, on some product or service and the PM team is deciding to grow and they're looking for a new PM, that'll be your best new, best first PM job because you're able to leverage your technical expertise about the product to sort of, you know, help you sort of ramp, fill the gap on stuff you can work on as you ramp up on the other core PM skills. That way you're not sort of walking in like, totally like, what do I do? But at least, hey, I can contribute by, you know, doing some uh, some field work or working on a new feature and just capturing feedback. Like this just gives you a, something that where you can sort of feel like you're adding value and as, until you learn how to do things like pricing, which is like totally left field, right? Or something you might that might be new to you. You also want to make sure you're setting yourself up for success by looking for teams with PM leaders either have a similar background or they have a successful track record of training SEs and, 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 and essays, right? Because again, it's, it's one of those things where you're going to need a little bit of mentorship to make the change. Um, like anything, practice makes perfect. It's something you've never done before. So you want to make sure you're, you're working with a, with a manager or with a team that is sort of can, uh, on board with helping you make the transition and make the change. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I find some folks on the PM side, especially if they come more with the traditional PM background, like you know, the MBA from the fancy school, they want to build a lot of frameworks. Those those often might not be the best first time PM managers unless they're really into the idea of developing technical talent. Right? It's just something where um, you you you, you want to make sure that you, there's someone that's going to help you out and have your back as you're making the change. And the other thing to think about is you want to look for con your your network connections and for opportunities working on really highly technical products. This again, this is the best place to sort of get, get started because if you're working on a product and data analytics or something that's working for developers, we those customers those companies want really technical PMs. They want folks that can you know talk with engineers because those are and developers who are your customers, data scientists, and really roll up their sleeves and get deep with them. So if you can sort of bring that technical back on, it, it, it's the leg up, right? And oftentimes, and I know when we have these types of roles, I'm more than willing to help someone develop their messaging if they can at least go out there and like get deep with a customer on the technology side, understand use cases and challenges because you know that 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 background takes a long time to to build up. So I'll leave you with sort of like a, you know, one final tip, right? So, you know, you also want to be accepting and do something about your blind spots. Doing new things is hard and it's uncomfortable at first because it's something you've never done before. Um, you, but you have to keep at it and you have to sort of, you know, be willing to learn and to be taught uh, to get good at something new, right? Um, most of your areas for growth, if you're sort of making that change from the PM, uh, I'm sorry, from the SA, SE side to PM, we're going to be on the business side. Odds are you've never developed pricing before as, a, as an SA or an SE. 
that's hard. It's not trivial. It takes skill. It takes practice. You know, you have to understand what are the, the decision points that come into that. How should you frame, you know, like a value and cogs and the market segments, all this other stuff, how all the things fit together. It takes, it takes practice and a lot of time to learn to do that stuff, right? Um, being able to do things like size and opportunity. Uh, you know, the, the, the worst feeling you have is when someone, an executive asks like, well, how, you know, how big is that market segment or how big is the opportunity there? You have to be able to have a number. Um, and that's your job as the PM, right? You have to understand because you, again, he's that executive spot or he or she's making the trade-off. You're like, do we fund this project or that project? Is which has the biggest opportunity for us? Which can we service more? Things like uh, addressable market, serviceable markets, all these sort of you know the, the business school stuff. Um, you just want to have a, 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 a basic understanding of what they mean and how to use them, how to quantify them and explain them, especially as you're talking to your leadership. Um, and also being able to think, do things like opportunity segmentation, right? Uh, I had an old boss used to always beat up. Well, is that really MISI, mutually exclusive? And I forgot the rest of the acronym, but it's not a wrong question. Like, you know, when you sort of are thinking about the opportunity, if you can break it down into pieces, it lets you then start to decide, well, should we focus on, on this piece first or that piece first? If we want, we, we know about the whole pie, but, you know, which piece should we to sort of bite off first, right? And again, these are new skills, something you really have in as an essay or an SE. You may have seen it. You may, you may be the consumer of the information during the enablement session and stuff like that, but developing it, doing the math, understanding what resources to use, how to do estimation, what's credible, all top-down analysis, bottoms-up analysis, all these things are new. And that's okay. You know, that's it's the far part. We grow, we learn, but you have to keep an open mind. You can't go in there and say, hey, I know how this thing works and this, this stuff doesn't matter. You have to really be willing to be taught. And do that, find a mentor. You know, there are lots of folks out there in, in tech and, in, and working in companies that, again, have that SASC background or an engineering background or just a technical background or didn't go to business school or maybe, you know, whatever. Um, those folks make great mentors. They understand sort of the practical challenges you're going through. Uh, they're sympathetic and they, you know, everyone likes to see people like them succeed, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, anytime I, you know, I, I find another SCRC that wants to make their own, heck yeah, I will spend an hour with you, Griffin, you know, what, why you like it, what do you want to do? What, you know, do you really want to be a product manager? Do you really want to be a product marketing manager? Do you want to be a tech marketing manager? Like, you know, you want to do something, you want to be in marketing, you, you know, helping you sort of work through all that stuff, right? Finding a mentor, you know, they can, someone you can sort of, you know, tap whenever you have a question. Um, they also give you honest feedback, right? If you're working on messaging for a new product, hey, like, can you kind of give me your thoughts on this? How did this look for the stuff I was working a year ago? Am I learning this stuff? You know, all those things, you know, just help, right? Getting that sort of feedback. I um, just want to take advantage of education resources, like watching these types of sessions of product school. There's also tons of books on business strategy and product management and case studies from this and that. Read, read as much as you can, right? You know, you want to make sure that um, you're not stuck in a position where you only learn a lesson when you go through it. That is a very expensive way to learn stuff. If you can stand on the shoulders of giants, learn, um, you know, what others have done, learn techniques for messaging and how, the, you know, how that works, learning different pricing scenarios and all that stuff. Like all that stuff's been written in books ad nauseum. So read the books. If, you know, I'm sure there's a book list out there. Read the, you know, the, all, the, all the VC books, right? Like all those do a pretty good job of, of talking about product management challenges, growing a company, growing a business, growing an opportunity. Um, you know, because again, reading is a re really fast way to learn because you're able to sort of digest a lot of other really good experience very quickly and, and apply it, right? So in summary, um, again, you know, SEs and SAs make great PMs because they have that technical background, that, that the deep customer empathy. It's a, it's a great transition for anyone that wants to sort of be more strategic in their career, have more ownership, have more sort of insight or, you know, have, have more influence on, you know, the product direction and strategy, that sort of nature. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, there is a learning curve, but it's manageable. Like I said, you just have to be willing to learn and willing to go do the, the work to sort of you know, ramp up on the skill that you, you're going to fill in the gap for. Um, but there's lots of opportunities to do that, right? Again, you can start off by just overdoing some more strategic stuff in your current role, see if there's, you know, uh, again, resources online and in books, but, you know, there's lots of ways to sort of learn that stuff. So that's pretty much it for my presentation today. Uh, you know, it would be remiss on me not to mention that, that I am hiring um, for product managers to work on Amazon Key Spaces, which is one of our non-relational database services. It's a really cool role. You know, you can, again, define the business strategy for your ownership, drive roadmap for new features, help grow the business. Key Spaces is a really cool product and service. You know, it helps some of the customers. 
run some of their, their biggest and most mission critical workloads. Um, if you want to learn more uh, about sort of NoSQL and, and the opening, please check out the, the job posting I've got here on the link. Um, you also can reach out to me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, you know, that always we're always looking for product managers at, at AWS, not just on my team, but across all of our, of our database and services team. So, you know, thank you very much for your time today and I hope you enjoy the presentation.